right. I believe we're live now and I see we're getting a few people joining. We'll just wait a few seconds for them to come in. Some of our fellow faculty members are among the attendees, I see. That's good. All right, let me go ahead and get started. Good, good afternoon. I want to welcome you to the Pi Sigma Alpha National Political Science Honor Society Fall 2020 induction ceremony for the Road New chapter here at Prairie View A&M University. My name is Stephen Huss. I am a lecturer with the Division of Social Work, Behavioral and Political Sciences, and I am the chapter advisor and organizer of this event. I would like to welcome all the faculty, uh, students, family, friends, and guests who are joining us via Zoom today in support of our remarkable cohort of students uh, who have enriched this institution and, and who will be formally inducted into Pi Sigma Alpha today. The five students who will be inducted uh, are Tiara Bailey, Katherine Jackson, Odiria Jackson, Taryn Levis, and Tamara Patrick. In these difficult times, it is good to celebrate the success and the achievement of our students and, and of your peers uh, and to recognize their academic excellence. I want to thank Dr. Maya Rocky Moore Cummings, our guest speaker, uh, for joining us to honor these inductees and to share with our audience her wealth of knowledge and experience. I want to thank Drs. Uh, Michael Nojum, Nathan Mitchell, and Melanie Price for joining this ceremony uh, to give testimonials on behalf of our inductees uh, and to recognize their achievements. I want to thank uh, senior political science major and Pi Sigma Alpha member Francine White uh, for joining us to be able to introduce our, our guest speaker. And then finally, I want to recognize Sean Twombly, the executive director of Pi Sigma Alpha, for supporting our chapter for these many years and for joining us today to speak on the centennial commemoration of Pi Sigma Alpha. And with that, I'll turn it over to Sean to speak. Go ahead, Sean. Thank you, Professor Puff. Thank you so much, everyone, for allowing me to be part of this great event. You know, as National Executive Director, I certainly wish that we were able to hold this event in person uh, with brownie bites and sparkling apple cider and the types of uh, treats that normally mark uh, these types of celebrations. Uh, in a virtual world, we, we take advantage of what we have, though, uh, and I'm pleased to be able to jump in from my basement in Potomac, Maryland. Uh, this is a, a really special year for us, and it's a special time for political science. Way back in my own undergraduate days, I was inducted into Pi Sigma Alpha, and it was a significant part of my own undergraduate experience. And as we add these new members here today, I hope that they will find it to be the same. Um, the row new chapter at Prairie View A&M is, is special to the organization. Not only was it chartered back in 1989 under the leadership of the legendary political scientist, Jewel Prestige, uh, but the faculty today has a deep connection to Pi Sigma Alpha. Professor Huss has supported this chapter for a number of years and I'm very thankful to him, Professor Najim, Professor Mitchell, Professor Price are all members of Pi Sigma Alpha as well. Professor Price herself was inducted into this chapter as an undergraduate student. The history of this chapter and Professor Jewel Prestige is a special one and I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. She was a mentor to our speaker today, Dr. Rocky Moore Cummings. Um, but she's an interesting story. And not only did she earn her undergraduate degree at Southern University in 1951 at the age of 19, she went on to graduate school at the University of Iowa uh, and is recognized as the first African-American woman to earn a PhD in political science, uh, which she earned in 1954. She returned to Prairie View uh, to teach for a couple of years, went back to Southern, and then we were pleased that she returned back to Prairie View after she retired at Southern uh, and launched this chapter here at Pi Sigma Alpha and actually became a member of the National Council of Pi Sigma Alpha at that time. More generally, it's a special year as part of our centennial 
Um, the health crisis has put a bit of a damper on our in-person events, but we've celebrated quite some quite something this year. Uh, Professor Huss will read a little bit more about our history when he walks through this centennial ritual. Uh, but by way of background, uh, Pi Sigma Alpha was formed deep in the heart of Texas. Uh, it was a campus at UT Austin in October 1920 that that first class of students was inducted. You'll learn a little bit more about it later. But I wanted to tell you a quick story about the, the one young woman that was inducted as part of that class in 1920. Remember your history, right? The 19th Amendment was just about to be ratified uh, for women, with women's suffrage. Uh, the young woman that year, her name was Mary McBride. And she didn't take any further education after her graduate from, graduation from UT Austin, but instead became a school teacher and married and moved to a small town in Texas called Yoakum. Now, from all the research that we've been able to do, it's clear that this young woman had as much impact on her small Texas town, both culturally and civically, as a lot of these other individuals did that with roles that took them far from the state of Texas. And the reason I share this story for you today is that regardless of your own future education or your own future employment, I want you to think about how you're taking your training at Prairie View a and and what role you will play as a citizen in this country. I realize uh, many of you followed the election very closely over the past few months, and I think it struck us all about where we stand as a country. I actually unearthed the original constitution for Pi Sigma Alpha. 1919, this booklet was printed well before that first class was even inducted. And the purpose of Pi Sigma Alpha, as it was stated in this book, is still relevant today. And I just wanted to share it with you real quickly. It stated that the purpose of Pi Sigma Alpha was to encourage the scientific and practical study of problems of government, to foster reforms in our government machinery, and to aid in the education of the electorate in problems of government. Now, as we've watched the news swirl around us these past few months, it's clear that we still have a lot to do. But you have this opportunity as you help launch Pi Sigma Alpha into its second century to be a citizen, to be an engaged citizen, and to have an impact on our society. You're joining a network that's 300,000 people strong. And it's fascinating to me that the network that you come from at Prairie View a and is represented in the audience here today with Dr. Price, with Dr. Rocky Moore Cummings, and hundreds of other students that have come before you at Prairie View. So with that, I'll throw it back to Professor Huss with my congratulations to each of you uh, and stick around for the rest of this wonderful centennial ritual. And, uh, and know that the national office is here to support you in any way we can moving forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. All right, we are now going to uh, hear from Francine White, a senior political science major and Pi Sigma Alpha member. Uh, Francine actually joined uh, in April of this year, but due to uh, the pandemic, uh, did not get to have the experience of the ceremony uh, that past cohorts have enjoyed. We will attempt to make up for this uh, with recognition later in this ceremony, uh, but for right now, Francine uh, will be introducing our guest speaker. Francine. Dr. Maya Rocky Moore Cummings is a social entrepreneur, speaker, writer, and strategist. She is president and CEO of Global Policy Solutions, a social change strategy firm and the Center for Global Policy Solutions, a nonprofit think and action organization that drives society towards inclusion by advancing health, wealth, educational and civic success for diverse populations. She earned her BA in political science from Prairie View A&M University and her MA and PhD in political science with an emphasis in public policy from Purdue University. She previously served as chair of the Maryland Democratic Party and VP of research and programs at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. Dr. Rocky Moore Cummings is the widow of the late American politician and civil rights advocate Elijah Cummings, who served in the United States House of Representatives for Maryland's 7th Congressional District from 1996 until his death in 2019. An accomplished public speaker and author, Maya has appeared on a variety of media outlets such as CBS, CNN, 
MSNBC, and Fox News, and her writings have been published in the New York Times, the Atlantic, the Huffington Post, and the Washington Post. She is the author of the po Political Action Handbook, a how-to guide for the hip-hop generation, and of the forthcoming book, Rageism, Race, Age, Gender, Exclusion, and the Politics of Health Equity. She is also co-editor of Strengthening Community, Social Insurance, in a Diverse America. She wrote the afterword for her late husband's book, We're Better Than This, My Fight for the Future of Our Democracy. She has served on numerous boards, including the National Association of Counties Financial Services Corporation, the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare, and the National Academy of Social Insurance. She is the recipient of multiple honors, including the Aspen Institute Henry Crown Fellowship Award and the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Fellowship Award, and has been a candidate for Maryland governor and the Dr. Rafi McCutney. Thank you, Francine. I am deeply appreciative of that lovely introduction. I want to uh, say that uh, I, um, I don't think that I've had a better one anytime lately. So thank you so much. I appreciate you. I want to, in her absence, uh, recognize and thank Dr. Ruth Simmons uh, for her fabulous and incredible leadership of Prairie View a and University. I feel like from afar, it looks like the, uh, the university is thriving and I'm excited. I know her leadership uh, has a lot to do with that. I also want to recognize my old colleague. Uh, certainly it was 30 years ago uh, that we were inducted into, well, I was inducted. I don't think, were we in the same class? I'm not sure. Uh, Pi Sigma Alpha, um, but uh, Dr. Melanie Price uh, for her significant leadership, moving mountains and doing great things uh, there at Prairie View a and University and beyond. Whenever you can open up your copy of the New York Times and see your uh, old uh, college uh, uh, colleague uh, with her op-ed there, you know that she's doing incredible work. And so I wanna congratulate her as well. Sean Twombly, uh, I was delighted uh, to be a keynote speaker at the centennial celebration, one of the centennial celebrations of the 100th year of uh, Pi Sigma Alpha. And Sean was just the most gracious host. I was able to speak to students from across the country and it was an incredible afternoon and I certainly enjoyed my time there. And I'm certainly so glad that I had an opportunity to participate in, in that event. Uh, and I also want to recognize Stephen Huss for the invitation, for coordinating, for doing the yeoman's work of, you know, pulling this all together. I know how it goes and I know what it's like. And so, you know, certainly hats off to you uh, and many bows to you for your leadership. Thank you so much. All the assembled faculty and certainly last but not least, the inductees tonight. You are simply incredible. You have proven that you have uh, the, the passion, uh, the uh, insight, uh, the fortitude, uh, and the commitment to rise to the highest levels in your chosen area of study. And so it is with uh, much uh, congratulations that I just want to say thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your dedication. Thank you for your commitment uh, that you are interested in pursuing political science, not just as an area of uh, a major area, but also something that you could possibly leverage and continue to pursue uh, in your, uh, you know, in your other career pursuits and certainly even in higher educational opportunities. So with that, I just want to say that my Pi Sigma Alpha experience was so incredible. We felt so special as we held our cam candles and, you know, we were in the dark for a moment and we did our induction ceremony and uh, we were lined up side by side and I will never forget that as long as I live. I have a photo of it. Uh, but, you know, what was special about it is that we felt that we were doing something important. We felt that we were a part of a special group of, of students uh, and indeed we were. Uh, and all of those students, of course, have gone on to uh, pursue their various uh, professional endeavors, uh, but every single one of them has proven in life to be committed uh, to not just the, uh, the pursuit of political science in the academic sense, uh, but also in the citizenship sense. 
Uh, and so with that, I just want to congratulate you again and thank you so very much for your leadership. So tonight, we are at the precipice, I think, of an important uh, moment in our history. I call it almost our zero moment as a nation. Uh, this is the point where we, as a country, can either continue to swim and navigate and to forge forward towards a more perfect union, or this could be the moment where our constitutional republic basically dies. Now, I hate to sound that stark, but really the stakes are that stark. What we have here is a national election where many people across the country, the most historic election turnout in a century that many reports account for. Uh, when we normally have national elections, uh, we have had approximately, uh, you know, at our lowest point, 50% of the eligible electorate participating. Uh, they are anticipating that we will have upwards of almost 75% of the eligible election, electorate participating in this election. And, uh, you know, by all accounts, the election has been secure. As everybody knows, in the 2016 election, the Russians uh, and other actors were busy trying to, uh, you know, hack uh, this system and that system. They were busy trying to leverage social media to upend uh, the uh, the perceptions of the electorate uh, and certainly to create chaos and havoc. And while certainly elements of that have been a part of this election season, uh, because we saw the playbook in 2016. Uh, there were a lot of efforts put forward to try to divert uh, and to prevent uh, that kind of interference in our election season this year. Yet we have had, of course, uh, all of this incredible turnout. Uh, and with the, uh, the results that we've seen, um, some of which have been uh, certified in states across the country and several states where we're still waiting for certification, uh, we have an apparent winner. Uh, and that winner of the presidency is Joe Biden. Yet we have an occupant in the White House, the current president, that is refusing, refusing to recognize uh, the, the, the legitimately cast votes of the American public, refusing to recognize that uh, he, uh, of course, has lost, uh, refusing to offer a concession, uh, certainly refusing so hard uh, that he's launched lawsuit after lawsuit only in those states uh, that were considered, of course, uh, the battleground states, um, which, by the way, were disproportionately black and brown. If we're talking about Michigan, if we're talking about Pennsylvania, if we're talking about Georgia, if we're talking about Nevada, if we're talking about Arizona, all of these states disproportionately certainly black and brown to basically say that there has been widespread fraud. He is putting this out there uh, with the hopes of, of course, stoking his base uh, to, of course, uh, you know, get them to believe his account. But his account is actually um, countered by the facts. And the facts are in the numbers. And the facts are also uh, by, you know, certainly a high ranking official in his own government who said that these were the most safest and secure election that we've had uh, in, in, in recent years. Uh, and certainly, uh, you know, there is a lot of danger in this moment that we find ourselves in. And I got to tell you, because I am so busy promoting my late husband's book, my late husband was former Congressman uh, Elijah Cummings. Uh, he chaired the House Oversight and Reform Committee of the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, and he had a very privileged perch in terms of understanding uh, the Trump administration uh, and certainly all of the actions and activities. The House Oversight and Reform Committee uh, is responsible for all of the major investigations uh, into uh, a president's administration and all of their agencies. Uh, and so he had uh, insight on everything from, you know, President Trump's taxes uh, and his uh, finances 
uh, to, you know, Jared and Ivanka's private email use, which there has been some, uh, to what's happened on the border with the Latino children and their families who were separated, uh, to what turned out to be uh, a uh, illegitimate question for the US Census that was also considered a racist question. Uh, there were a lot of investigations that came out of the Trump administration that gave uh, Elijah, I think, deep insight uh, into the nature of the man uh, and his purpose, frankly. Uh, and what my late husband concluded, and of course what I've been able to conclude just by observation uh, and proximity, uh, is that uh, our current president of the United States of America does not have respect or regard for the US Constitution. He does not have respect or regard for our democratic norms. He does not have respect or regard for our laws. And he manages to use our legal system not to pursue justice, but to actually avoid accountability, tying up the courts to rope-a-dope or uh, to undo uh, important protections for the American people. And one additional thing I'd like to add is that he, uh, as a part of not respecting democratic norms, has shown himself willing uh, to actually use the agencies of the US government against the American people and for his own personal purposes, often political. So whether we're talking about the US Postal Service, uh, where he installed a loyalist, uh, it seems like with the hopes of subverting mail-in ballots at the Postal Service, but at the same time, cutting off access to important medications for our seniors who get their medications in the, in the mail, uh, all kinds of important things that people were expecting in the mail were delayed for weeks. Uh, and so that was an uproar. The US Justice Department, where he has gotten our uh, you know, top lawyer for the nation uh, and the Justice Department has historically had an arm's length relationship to uh, the president in the White House because they wanted to actually have at least a veneer of independence. Uh, but this Justice Department has been used as the president's own personal legal arm. Uh, most recently, uh, they filed a lawsuit uh, or a counter lawsuit uh, against a woman who years ago uh, accused our current president, Donald Trump, of, uh, of raping her. Uh, and he got the Justice Department to actually launch a, a counter uh, effort. Uh, and that was recently tossed out. But that has raised red flags across this country, particularly amongst American uh, 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 legal uh, minds and attorneys uh, who, understands, uh, who understand what this means. But you, we've seen it across the board, whether it's the FDA that he's tried to subvert or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention where he has, the White House has taken over the data collection and the presentation of public data, uh, creating all kinds of dissension and confusion. So he's refusing to leave and that is a problem because the question becomes is what happens next? And frankly, nobody knows. Everybody is playing it by ear, but get this. Experts who have uh, you know, watched uh, dictators and authoritarian regimes around the world see a pattern uh, that is happening here in the United States that has happened in other countries. And if we are not careful at this moment in time, if we do not have a peaceful transfer of power, if we do not insist on ensuring that our constitutional republic we often call it our, our democracy, remains intact. If we do not do that, then we will go by the way of places like Argentina and Brazil and other people, other places that have fallen to authoritarian regimes or dictatorships over time. And, and this would be such, not just a tragedy for the United States of America, because of course, as you all know, uh, the country has held itself up as the uh, beacon on the hill. It has often promoted democracy abroad. Uh, its past posture in the international arena has been one of, you know, uh, promoting and even 
uh, you know, making aid uh, dependent upon democratic reforms all for the purpose of making sure that the people of countries around the world have a say in how they are governed, that the people can help drive uh, the future direction of their country uh, and the policies therein. And that is what is at stake at this moment in time. It is our ability to have a say in our future, how we are treated, what our country's priorities are, what our protections are for our citizens, how we will decide to move forward as a nation. All of these things are at stake, but guess what is especially at stake? Our freedom. Because when you live in an authoritarian regime, you can get disappeared overnight and nobody will ever know what happened to you. You can't speak out freely because you know of the, of the threats or the th what can happen to what could potentially happen to you or your family members you don't have the freedoms that we have currently embedded in the constitution the five freedoms that include by the way the right to protest the right to freedom of speech you know all of these rights that are important for a democracy that are important for people's voices to be heard and so with that this is our zero moment and we've got to be vigilant. And if we have to take to the streets, if we have to speak out, if we have to protest, that may but be what we have to do. But let me just say this. Why was my late husband and people like John Lewis, the late Congressman John Lewis, and the late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, such staunch defenders and protectors of our democracy. Why? Just think about it. Elijah was born an African-American man in the Jim Crow South. Black people were treated as they were marginal. We were marginalized. Um, you know, I'm just the fourth generation from slavery on my mother's side. Uh, and I grew up with stories of what it was like for my parents to grow up in the Jim Crow South. Elijah grew up in the Jim Crow South. He knew what it was like to go to a separate and unequal school. He knew what it was like not to be able to um, swim uh, in you know, any pool he wanted to or to uh, you know, go into stores downtown or to try on clothes in stores or to sit wherever he wanted in a movie theater or to drink out of whatever water fountain he wanted to drink out of. There was a time in this country where everything was separate and where black people were relegated to the margins of society, used as beasts of burdens uh, to basically prop up the American economy uh, and certainly uh, to um, you know, uh, serve as the uh, undercast, if you will. And I encourage you, if you have not read Cast by Isabel Wilkerson, to please pick up a copy and read it uh, over the holiday season. It is excellent. Uh, and so why would somebody who has been so mistreated by the United States government and the majority population, why would somebody like that? Why would somebody like John Lewis, who as he marched for his right to vote, was beaten over the head uh, by police officers and arms of the, of the state? Uh, you know, why would he why would Elijah, why would Ruth Bader Ginsburg as a woman and as a Jewish woman from a persecuted uh, people, uh, you know, marginalized because she was a woman, why would she, Elijah Cummings and John Lewis all become the penultimate insiders after being mistreated and considered outcasts and outsiders in their youth? Why? That is the question and this is the answer because every single one of them knew that when you press, when you use the levers of the law to challenge the system, when you use your five freedoms, when you speak out against the system, when you protest, when you work the system, when you advocate, when you do everything possible that a democracy like ours affords to challenge the system, it is possible to change the system. They saw it in their lifetimes. They saw the civil rights movement 
come into being and make a substantive change in the lives of, of many people around the country. They saw the women's rights movement come into being and make a substantive change in the, in the rights of women across this country. They saw what a difference they can make when they spoke up, when they stood out, when they pushed, when they demanded, when they uh, basically um, you know, leveraged all of the powers that are afforded to them in their democracy. And so they became the staunchest defenders of our democracy because they knew that that would not have been possible with any other form of government. They knew that it would not have been a possible, possible in an authoritarian regime or a dictatorship. They knew that just as it was important for them to speak out and demand justice and equality and equity, that they also had to protect and defend democracy because it is this structure of government that allows us to move towards a more perfect union. And so I just like to close tonight by saying that we actually have a job to do. We are at another moment in time where we have to remind America why we are who we are. We have to remind America why democracy is so very important for our foundational purposes, but also for our future. We have to be the conscious of the, uh, the nation. We have to speak out. We have to, we have to do everything in our power to make sure that we are moving this nation towards a more just, inclusive, equitable, and diverse future. And it is up to you, every single one of you, and us, because I consider myself a part of that, to help move this nation forward. And yes, it might be uncomfortable. It might require us to get out of our comfort zones. It might require us to do things that we don't typically do. It might require us to move to a new level of sophistication when it comes to political participation in this country. And I am proud to say that I have seen not just the voters come out in record numbers, many of them first time voters, many of them uh, the voters of color, uh, you know, that's exciting. But it's not just about the vote. Freedom, I am sorry to tell you, but you have to understand this, requires constant engagement. If you want freedom, if you want this nation to be responsive to the needs of your community, of your family, certainly of your, 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 your community, they, then you have to be a constant presence. You have to be active, you have to be engaged. Freedom is not free, it requires work. And so with that, I just want to say that, you know, this moment in time is so incredibly important because what we're launching here and now is an inclusion revolution. It's a, it's a movement for the future of our democracy. And I am so proud uh, to be a part of this ceremony tonight and to encourage you in your pursuits because I know uh, that you all will take this seriously and that you will continue to stand up and stand out and do whatever it takes to move our, our nation forward. So I wanna say thank you and congratulations again. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rocky Moore Cummings. Uh, your words, uh, they mean a lot uh, to our inductees, to our, our students and, and community that are viewing. And we recognize the challenges that are ahead for all of us, but I'm very hopeful with uh, the students I've encountered at Prairie View, our students this evening. I'm very hopeful still for the future. We are now going to uh, move into our faculty testimonials uh, to recognize our inductees this evening. Our faculty are the ones who have worked closely uh, with these students and have mentored them uh, in pursuit of their degrees and their career paths. And we're gonna begin with uh, Dr. Nathan Mitchell and his testimonials. Thank you all for uh, coming tonight. Um, Dr. Uh, Tabitha Morton and I had the really intense pleasure of being some of the first classes that our students get to take in the major. Um, I teach the research class and then I also teach the seminar course where I get to see them towards the end of their degrees. And so 
one of the things that I can notice about all of our inductees tonight is just the amount of growth. Um, John Maxwell said, a leader is one who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. And I think that that's something that's really important for all of our inductees, um, whether in the classroom, outside of the classroom. Um, many of our inductees are working, you know, a lot of hours, not just, you know, uh, in their studies, but, you know, trying to work through school and overcoming many challenges and things of that nature. Um, I am here to talk about Tierra Bailey. Um, I have watched Ms. Bailey grow from a very shy, quiet, you know, sophomore, and, and she's just developed into this wonderful leader. One of the things that you will notice in class is that she's a little quiet at times, but that quiet does not mean that she's not paying attention or that she's not there, but she is coming from a place of wisdom and she's trying to take in a little, you know, all the different pieces before she um, really, really acts. So she's a very analytical type of person. Um, what I'm so impressed about it, though, is her service. Um, she uh, is involved in the community. Um, she works in the Prairie View, uh, City of Prairie View, uh, in the Protective Village Campaign, which is uh, one of the council members has uh, just taken it upon himself to uh, go neighborhood by neighborhood and uh, try to make the place uh, of the City of Prairie View better. And so she's been working very heavily with that program. She's worked on multiple political campaigns. She got to help elect the youngest uh, uh, county commissioner in the state of Texas. Uh, she worked on Kendrick Jones' campaign. Um, she uh, has been involved in Blackstone Pre-Law. She's been involved in lots and lots of things on campus. So she's very impressive for her work and her um, just the ability to balance it all. I'm just so encouraged by everything that she's able to, to accomplish. Um, lastly, she's also a scholar. Uh, last year, she got to uh, help design a uh, quality of life study that, you know, to actually study rural issues in Texas. We weren't able to complete it because of COVID, but you know, her wisdom in that project is really good as well. Um, I was also supposed to talk about Tamara Patrick. Um, and I'm going to say something very quickly, even though she's not here. Um, she is also a dynamic leader. Um, she has never met a class that she couldn't make an A in. Um, she goes way over um, in terms of analysis and being in depth. Um, she is, uh, both these students have always pushed me to be a better teacher. Um, Tamara was one of our inaugural um, inductees on the Panthers and Capitol Hill program. And she got to work with uh, Congressman Cleaver's office. And so we know that both of these individuals, uh, these students are just going to be wonderful leaders and we're so much better for them. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Nathan, Dr. Mitchell. Um, we're going to go ahead now and hear from Dr. Melanie Price, uh, her testimonials. Thank you so much, um, Stephen. This is my first time doing this, so I don't know if I'm going to do as well as Nathan. He had a whole resume, so I'm going to try to <laughs> try to meet that. Um, this is uh, actually a surreal moment, one of many I've had since I've come back to the campus, where um, I get to see what um, my Maya and my mentor, she was planning for us to be leaders and we didn't know how. And what she did was she instilled in us, not the idea that you had to be a leader, but she was like, you have to acquire skills and do well at the jobs that you are assigned. And over the years, I have watched Maya do well at the jobs that she has um, been assigned. And it's been really cool to watch and I think for our students, it should be a moment where you start to think, what will my friendships look like um, you know, 30 years from now? What will my career look like? And who will I be looking back to talk to at Prairie View 20 years from now? You must maintain a connection to your political science community here, to your student community, and I hope you do so. So I have two students today. First, I have Katherine Jackson. So Catherine was one of the first students who started coming to my office when I taught my first uh, class here. 
And so I was new. I didn't really know any of the students. And so I was unsure whether or not I was actually doing a sufficient job. You know, each campus has its own um, personality and you never sort of know, you have to learn it. Even though I was a student here, that was quite some time ago. You have to learn how you're doing. And so I looked to her visits as a way of sort of understanding if I was doing okay, right? She would ask these probing questions about, you know, what was happening, but she would also ask questions about sort of how I got here. I had the feeling that at, we were both trying to figure each other out at the same time. But what I learned from those meetings is that she is a born leader. And when I would talk to her, I would think, this is the kind of student that I have come back here to work with. This is the kind of future leader that I must nurture. And in Catherine, I found somebody who is whip smart, who is warm, and who is focused. And I revel in the thought of what she does next that will not only affirm her beliefs about her capabilities in herself, but will also be something that makes the entire university and the political science program very, very proud. Now, Taryn is sort of the opposite. Whereas Catherine came in sort of talking, Taryn was the kind of student that you have to make talk to you. And for some reason, as a teacher, I see this as like a personal challenge. I don't know. I see quiet students and I am like, no, you will talk to me. And so <laughs> it was a journey for the two of us where I would just ask her questions out of the blue. And she was like, wait a minute. I did not raise my hand. I would constantly be like, Taryn, did you raise your hand? And she is like, you know, I did not. You know, I didn't raise my hand. But when we all dispersed in March for the pandemic, I gave all of this, my, I gave my class my cell phone number because we were all sort of unsure about what was gonna come next. And one day, like in early summer, I get a text from Taryn saying, I wanna do more reading. Can you recommend books to me that I could read over the summer? And I say to her, I'll send you some books, but you have to talk to me about them when you're done. And so I, was, I honestly say we haven't talked, but I get these random texts where she'll say stuff like Toni Morrison, wow. And I know when she says that, it's as it's a hundred words for other students. And so I want to say about Taryn is that she I am impressed with her keen intellect and her pursuit of knowledge. And I think more of us could be more economical about our words so that when she says something in class, you know that it is something that she really believes needs to be said. So welcome to Pi Sigma Alpha, Catherine. Welcome to Pi Sigma Alpha, Taryn. All right, thank you, Dr. Price. And now we will hear from Dr. Uh, Michael Nosham. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about Od Odie and Odaria, and Odaria Jackson. Um, and I didn't know I could call her by her nickname until last week. So I'm going to be, I'm going to assume that privilege, Odie, and call you Odie from now on, unless you tell me otherwise. I'm, when I listened to Dr. Maya Rockmore Cummings' speech, I, I was very nervous because she laid out a, a, a stark uh, scenario. And she even used the word stark and she explained it to us. But then I thought to myself, I'm, I'm going to be introducing one of the students who I know will take care of my future for me, who I know the future is in good hands with, and that's Odaria. Odaria is being inducted into the National Political Science Honor Society, and she's, it's aptly named because she is honorable. She, she comes to my office, she texts me, she is upfront, she is straightforward, she has massive amounts of integrity. She's mad courageous. And I am just so thankful that my experience with Odie gives me this chance to feel comfortable about the future and to know that the future is in, that, that, that Dr. Rockamore's future, as she described it, is in such good hands with Odie that I'm, I'm, I'm comforted by that. And I feel like that, especially at this age, now that I've reached a certain milestone age, I think about my legacy 
and that there are more years behind me than there are in front of me. And then and that makes me think about the future. And I'm comforted by the fact that someone of Odie's drive, Odie's courage, Odie's integrity, Odie's thoughtfulness and sensitivity is keeps us in, keeps the future in good hands. I'm gonna let Odie talk about her dreams because it's not for me to talk about her dreams, but she, she, she wants to have her own business. And she'd come to my office and talk about what she wants to do with her life. And she'd text me and she'd Zoom me about what she wants to do with her, 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 her future. And her future is to be an entrepreneur. And I'm gonna let her talk about that if, if there's time later. But I want, I want you to see that type of leadership in her that she's already thinking about her own business and her own entrepreneurial career. So congratulations, Odie. I'm so proud of you. You know I love you and I'm, I'm gonna be sorry to see you go. Am I to do um, the next one or do we wait a minute? Okay, so Francine, where are you? Are you there? Francine was inducted last year without a ceremony, without the pomp and circumstance, without any of the, 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 the gracious celebration that we could, that we could offer them. So we, we decided that since we have her here today, I'm going to take this chance to give a little testimony about, about Francine. And I don't know if you know about Francine, but I'm going to tell you about Francine. Francine, I got a call from her once. I was about two years ago, I think, right? Was it 17 or 18? Dr. Mike, I'm quitting. She was gonna quit, y'all. She was done. She was so, she had so many obstacles. She was working 20 or 30 hours a week. She had crazy issues with the housing authority. She was not feeling her courses. She was not feeling her instructors. She didn't even know what the purpose was. And we talked for maybe an hour over this. And after we talked, just talk, actually just listening to her and just asking her questions and realizing I, that she didn't know, quite know what she wanted to do and she may still not know, but her persistence and her stick to is is what turned out to be not only a student who's gonna graduate next month, but a student who now got a, a huge GPA and she's a member of the Honor Society. And I'm so, so proud of you, Francine. And I can't tell you how proud I am to see you turn the corner that you did going from this the verge of not finishing to not only finishing but finishing with such gusto and such momentum that now you're you're attending law school workshops and graduate school recruiter workshops thinking about the next stage when you weren't even thinking about going finishing your bachelor's degree i'm so proud of you um, and i and again i am so comforted by the fact that you are part of my future and you are part of this country's future truly that that's true for all of you i've had all of you in class I love every single one of you, and I'm gonna be sorry to see you go. Thank you, and bless you all. Somebody else talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Notion. And, and thank you to all of our faculty uh, who support and, and shape the minds and, and spirits of our students through their dedication and, and commitment to teaching. Um, we have many students, you know, many juniors, many seniors who will be preparing in these next few semesters, uh, be in similar shoes as, as yours going out into the world. Uh, and we find great comfort that uh, you are being prepared. You are going to face these challenges uh, with strength and with conviction. So it is now time for uh, the formal initiation ritual. Now our inductees have received via mail or other means uh, their certificates, lapel pins, and other graduation regalia already. But I would ask them to consider the words of the ritual carefully and to think back on their work here and the future that lies ahead for them. Members of Pi Sigma Alpha, candidates for initiation, and friends. We are here today for the purpose of initiating new members into Pi Sigma Alpha, the National Political Science Honor Society. This is a special year for Pi Sigma Alpha. It is our centennial. 100 years ago, 
in October 1920, the first class of members was inducted at the University of Texas, Austin. The organization sought to encourage and recognize superior achievement in the study of government and politics at the undergraduate and graduate level. That first class included 13 students, among them a future Supreme Court Justice and U.S. Attorney General, a future U.S. Ambassador, a number of future attorneys, and other individuals who would go on to make an impact at local, national, and international levels. Today, Pi Sigma Alpha hosts chapters on nearly 850 campuses and has inducted more than 300,000 members. Its roles feature national, state, and local political leaders, including one president, three Supreme Court justices, and dozens of members of Congress. The network of Pi Sigma Alpha members stretches across law, academia, business, and more. The study of politics and government is one of the noblest of academic pursuits because a deep and true understanding of the principles by which we govern ourselves contributes directly to the quality of our lives and the well being of future generations. You have demonstrated both by your interest in and commitment to this discipline and by your high scholastic achievement that you have the potential to excel as citizens and scholars and so deserve the honor of membership in Pi Sigma Alpha. With this special honor come the special obligations of leaders to exemplify and safeguard the academic aims of this university the honesty and integrity of its scholars and the ideals of your alma mater. You have earned membership in this illustrious society by attaining the highest standards of scholarship, not only in the discipline of political science, but in your overall academic work as well, in accordance with the rigorous criteria set forth by the national constitution of Pi Sigma Alpha the bylaws of Road New Chapter and the strict requirements of the Association of College Honor Societies. Candidates for initiation. Your eligibility for membership in Pi Sigma Alpha has been vouched for by myself. And so you are duly invited to lifetime membership in both the national organization of Pi Sigma Alpha and the Road New Chapter. By accepting this honor, you signify your acceptance of and commitment to the ideals of high scholarship, integrity, and citizenship embodied in the goals of this institution and of Pi Sigma Alpha. Tierra Bailey, Katherine Jackson, Odiria Jackson, Taryn Levis, Tamara Patrick, and also Francine White. Congratulations to you all. And with that, our program is concluded. Thank you again to our guest speaker, Dr. Rocky Moore Cummings, to Sean Twombly, to Drs. Michael Nozjum, Nathan Mitchell, and Melanie Price, and to Francine White, for their participation and support. Stephen, can I jump in real quick? I just yeah, want to say one please. last thing. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I, I want to. I want to. As the program coordinator, I want to personally thank you for organizing this amazing program and doing it every year, sometimes every semester. I just have to say, you 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 top yourself every year, and, and it's for me. It's just one less thing that I have to worry about knowing that this is that that this program that you're doing is in such great hands. So thank you, Stephen, so much for all your hard work on this. Thank you, Dr. Rocky, Rocky Moore Cummings for, for attending. Thank you, Sean, for coming and everybody else. Just great job. Thank you so much for that. And again, thank you, Dr. Rocky Moore Cummings. Thank you to all of you for being here. And I'm gonna wish you a good evening. Have a good evening, everyone.